terms of ocean and ice and glaciers and all that fun stuff. So um, as such, you can already imagine, uh, for me, the atmosphere is sort of my bread and butter, but it's not just what's happening within the atmosphere, but it's also how the atmosphere interacts with all the other parts uh, that makes it complex. Okay, so climate itself, when we think of it, is the technical definition is the average of different pa um, meteorological patterns. So for example, the average of temperature, precipitation, wind, humidity at a given place. When we talk about Earth's climate, we're thinking of the Earth as a whole. So don't have to memorize, no test, don't worry, <laughs> relax. But I just want to give you a big picture of when you say complexity. Well, it's not just the different parts that work with each other, but there's also other parts to the system. So for example, how the sun interacts, like the sun is changing over time and we monitor that as well. And so how the changes within the sun affect the earth and then the earth's sun system. Uh, there's also in terms of motions of the planet as, as, a, as a body within the universe uh, have an impact on climate. Uh, how much um, the term we call albedo is uh, basically how much of the sun's rays that reach the surface reflect back to space. Uh, and depending on what kind of surface you have, whether you have ice or whether you have oceans, that number is going to be different. Um, and so, you know, again, I'll go back to when we were talking earlier about energy, our main source of energy is the sun. So the question is, you know, how is that energy that we do get every day, whether we want or not, which we do want to have to, um, how, how does it interact with the whole system? Uh, so, and we can change that. So it's sort of a, a rebalancing of all those rays that come from the sun, how they sort of mix in within the Earth system. Uh, then there's atmospheric composition, different gases like chemical molecules per se that affect how uh, the sun's rays interact, how they reach the surface, um, the greenhouse effect that you probably have heard of. Um, then when you start thinking about, well, it's not just what the makeup of all of this is, but then it's how things move around, right? So then things start, um, you start in one location and then you see things moving to another location. And so there are currents within the ocean itself, currents within the atmosphere, and then there is an interaction between ocean and atmosphere as well. Uh, then there's the biosphere, which is another part of it, and then there's also plate tectonics and volcanic eruptions. So, it, there are a lot of parts to the system. And so when people go, well, you can't even predict weather you know, the next day. Well, think about all the different parts that you have to get right in order to be perfect. Like if you want to mimic mother nature, you have to get all this right. I don't think we'll ever kind of get there. We'll get better at it, but. Um, and so this is just a quick example. So um, I'll show you a lot of pictures from some of the travel that I've uh, had the privilege to do. Uh, and this is on one of the aircraft companies where we flew pole to pole, sampling the uh, Earth, uh, the Earth's atmosphere um, from the surface to about uh, 30,000 feet, and we got to almost 50,000 feet over the tropics. Uh, so these are views that I took of different parts of the view from the uh, from the aircraft. Um, but this is just wanted to, to depict you the difference between what weather is and what climate is. And yes, I am giving you a snapshot of a picture or just a picture for, for each of these terms. But what I want to show you here, short term is, you know, clouds, beautiful rainbows that form. It's just something that's happened more instantaneously. Uh, what I mean here when I say climate, what I'm showing here are glaciers over Alaska. And these glaciers several years ago used to go all the way to the ocean. And they're retreating over time. And this is what we're seeing at this point. If I were to go, these pictures were taken um, 12 years ago, if I were to go back to these locations, uh, they would probably look even shorter, uh, more receded into the particular thing. All right, so now how do we study climate? You know, we as scientists, we say, okay, well, here are numbers, we're saying humans are impacting the Earth system, but how do we know that? Well, so there are many tools that we use, tools are the trade. Um, we can use satellites, so instruments that we put um, on Earth's orbit uh, to look at the Earth from a very long, um, from far away that allows us to cover a lot of 
uh, surface in shorter periods of time. Uh, we can also use specialized aircraft, and this is where my focus uh, over the last 30 years has been, um, where we install like different nooks and crannies within those aircraft where we can build instruments and install them, and then we coordinate um, where to fly, uh, for how long, um, and then we have uh, a tremendous team effort required to collect all that information and then we take that to the lab, analyze it, and write our publications. Uh, we can also do balloons. We can also make measurements from ships. We can look at tree rings. They give us a lot of information about history. Uh, we can also set up towers uh, to monitor uh, what the concentrations look like uh, over long periods of time. Um, my research group at Harvard has a station uh, located in Harvard, Massachusetts, and uh, they've been looking at Harvard Forest for decades at this point. And those are things that are very helpful to have when looking at climate in particular because you have a long-term record of what um, the composition of the air has been looking like. Um, and then we've also gained, in the, in the past uh, decade or so, uh, increased interest in monitoring urban emissions. Uh, in the past, it has been much longer scale that we were uh, focusing on, but now we're seeing uh, there's a lot of emissions that we can capture like within a street level uh, to this point. And so we take instruments and we actually deploy them to different locations. Um, we can also look at sediments, obviously, pores. Um, and then all this information that we collect from all these different ways of observing the system, we then feed them into what we call uh, global circulation models. And so these are the models that we use to forecast what things are gonna look like. So when we say, oh, it's gonna warm up by this much, uh, this is where it all is coming from. So it, it's a combination of our understanding of the physics in a mathematical form, um, but it's also fed by all the observations that we have so far. And so this is a depiction of our, the current status of uh, what global temperatures look like. So we have been since uh, roughly 1850s, what we're using as our sort of like point zero for the pre-industrial era. And so we've had a lot of observations uh, throughout the earth, throughout the surface, not looking at everywhere equally, but um, at some locations where we have been able to monitor temperatures on the ground for, for uh, over a decade, uh, over a century in the state. And so these are different models that are used to put together all the information um, and then extrapolate some into the future. But some of this is based on observations, this part here. So the first thing, when you look at a plot like this, without even knowing what the plot is like, right? You have x-axis, this is time, and this is some variable that's changing over time, uh, time increase in this direction. What you can tell is, well, this is flat, that looks pretty stable, and then suddenly, well, there was a little uptick here, and now we just took off. Where are we going there? So this is our current time, so last few decades in Earth's history. So what we're seeing is an unprecedented climb in temperatures around the globe. Now, just as I said earlier, this is a uh, change that has been uh, measured throughout the globe with the aid of some models, because we can't measure everywhere on, on Earth, but we use models to uh, bring together points that are nearby and sort of create this mosaic of, of temperatures. And so for the last 50 years of change, this color here corresponds to how much warming, so the warmer it's gotten, the redder, and the cooler, the bluer. And so you can see that on when you're looking from a regional perspective, there's a lot more uh, warming that's happening over the Arctic region, and then followed by where you see most of where humans live on uh, land masses, and then less of that over the oceans, and then even some cooling that over here. So when you talk about um, global, uh, um, global warming and uh, surface temperatures increasing, the number that you get here, it's an average of all of this. So whether you live here or here is going to be different for you locally. But as a as a whole, when people tell you, oh, you know, average, you know, we're we're headed towards two degrees. So now you know what it means. It's an average of the whole globe. Um, 
when I was teaching in grad school, one of the students, remember, I remember saying, oh, so that means we're not going to get any more snow in Boston. That's great. Who <laughs> wants winter anyway? And they're like, well, that's not how climate change works. Does it mean that, you know, a plus two Celsius means plus two Celsius everywhere? It means that actually it's, it's a dangerous thing, right? If you think in a mathematical perspective, if it's an average, it means that some places are going to be even more than that number and some others are going to be even below that number. And some locations might find themselves right at that average. Um, and so there's evidence, and probably won't bug you too much with this, but I do want to show you that there is evidence that, uh, or measurements that we have here that show, in this case, this is a, a trace for temperature increases, just like I showed earlier. And this is a trace here that shows you what the sun has been doing, so output from the sun. So if we think, well, all these increases in temperatures that we're seeing, we're not saying what that's due to, we're just saying we're seeing increases in temperature. Um, we're saying, well, maybe this is because the sun is getting hotter, right? Good, uh, if that would be natural variability. But the sun is not getting hotter, so we have evidence that we're looking at the uh, input of the energy coming out of the sun, and it's not happening. So now it's sort of like a detective work. It's like you have the evidence that crime scene is in front of you, and now you have to reconstruct it and see, you know, what drives what part of it. Um, and so similarly, we have a concentration. This is uh, observations of my favorite molecule, one of them, actually. Uh, this actually, a lot of my work is focused around studying uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at higher altitudes. Um, we have set up locations throughout the globe. In this case, I'm showing you uh, stations on the ground at the South Pole, American Samoa, which is in the Southern Hemisphere, Hawaii, and Barrow, Alaska. And we have been constantly since the 1970s, actually they go so a little bit earlier in some locations, have been measuring CO2 in the atmosphere every day. Um, and this is what we're seeing, things are changing. So if you look at it from the perspective of just a plot, it looks like there is a line and it's just going high in this direction. Well, this direction is time and this means that you have more here than you have there. And so we're seeing in CO2 um, by itself that there are changes and things are going up over time. I can dwell more into some of the details if you're interested, uh, but I probably won't spend too much of time doing that uh, as to like why you have these wiggles and why the yellows are bigger than the greens. We have an explanation for all of that. None of that is known to us. But I want to save some of your uh, mental focus for some fun stuff too. Um, and uh, this is another interesting one. Um, a lot of people, especially those who don't believe that humans have much to do with climate change, uh, go, well, but uh, climate has been changing for, for centuries, for thousands of years in the past. And it is true. This is a record of CO2 uh, concentrations and temperature uh, changes uh, for the past 800,000 years that were extracted out of uh, ice cores wow. in Antarctica. So you go there, you drill holes, and you very carefully extract them and very carefully sample and analyze them in your lab. Every little layer within this core is a time step in mm -hmm. history. And so you can analyze at every point in, within the depth, you know, it corresponds to like one tick within this plot. But what we do see are two things. One is you see CO2 is going up and temperature goes up. CO2 goes down and temperature goes down. And so that tells you, well, of course it's getting warmer because there's more CO2 in the atmosphere. So yeah, exactly. Or is it the other way around? We don't know. Uh, we believe that uh, CO2 is the driver, not that temperature is the driver. But the other thing that's interesting about it is that this is present time. This is, this is us humans uh, producing massive amounts of energy for survival. Uh, and so if you look at it right now, we stand at 420 parts per million as the unit that we use for CO2. Uh, and it has not seen, it has not been this high in the last 800,000 years. So it's not just the uh, number itself that's so high, but it's the rate at which it has happened that is coincident with us being here. Um, so those two pieces of evidence, this is just looking at, at face value, which is to tell you it's hard to believe that humans have no influence on climate when we're seeing what we're seeing here. Um, one of the 
great stories in, in the community that I've been part of um, has been the story of the uh, Charter Strait Ozone Hole. You've probably heard about it uh, over Antarctica in the uh, late 70s. We started discovering that there was a thinning of the ozone. Uh, so we were losing ozone molecules over Antarctica during uh, mostly springtime in the southern hemisphere. And it was getting bigger and bigger uh, with time. And the concern was, well, there's not too many people that live there, so who cares? Um, one way of looking at it. However, a thing of the ozone layer, what really means is that more of the UV rays that ozone absorbs, um, which is what protects us, so it's our sunscreen, essentially. Um, so with fewer molecules of ozone there, more of those UV rays actually reach the surface. Um, and so we started seeing that happening. This was, uh, these are caused from Antarctica. We also, and you see that here. So this is a function of time and concentration. So you just see, we start measuring fewer and fewer molecules of ozone as a function of time over Antarctica. And then we also started seeing that over the Arctic region. And so studies that we uh, pursued to understand what was the chemistry driving this process revealed that it was the release of chlorofluorocarbon CFCs into the atmosphere that were used as refrigerants, uh, they're using the insulation industry, um, as fire retardants as well. And so they actually interacted once released at the surface and they go up in the air, they uh, actually interacted with UV rays and uh, destroyed it was a molecule. So the success story for us was that very early on, everybody got together and said, okay, we have to attack this problem. So this was uh, started in 1987 with the Montreal Protocol and uh, most countries got together, and right now we're at a point where the ozone, uh, the, uh, ozone hole of Antarctica is starting to recover, but because we did this massive bannings of those particular molecules, so that has helped. Um, so um, another thing that people also like to uh, question when, when it comes to, well, are humans really involved in climate change, um, is the, um, sort of composi changes in composition of the air. So I showed you earlier how CO2, which is depicted up here, again, this is all over time, is going up in the atmosphere. Well, if humans had nothing to do with it, then it would be just CO2 that's changing. But we're actually seeing um, complementary changes along with it. And what I mean by that is um, we're seeing the red trees here uh, tells you about the acidity uh, of the ocean, so this is CO2 in the ocean. Uh, so concentrations of CO2 in ocean water are increasing over time because there's more of it being uh, pumped into the air and air and water interact at a certain level. So some of the CO2 that we emit actually gets absorbed into the water and so that water gets acidified. And if you're a chemist or love chemistry, everybody here, right? <laughs> um, you know that when you increase acidity, you decrease your pH. So uh, the pH of, of the uh, ocean water is also starting to go down. Now it's not a huge change, but we're seeing the trend. That's where you start. That's where we start. Um, also, because CO2 is being burned, or we're burning fossil fuels and emitting CO2, that means that in the in process of any burning you have to use up oxygen. And so this trace down here, the blue, corresponds to oxygen concentrations in the air. And we're seeing those going down as well. So again, it's, you know, it's the prime scene. It's like all, all the different aspects of it have to line up. You can't have you know, one evidence tell you one thing and another tell you something different. So uh, slowly but surely, we're constructing that um, with more and more observations. Um, and this is another important one that I thought was helpful to uh, share with you, and that is, okay, so you have all these observations, and how do we, I'm, I'm still not convinced that humans had anything to do with climate change. Okay, fine, fair enough. Well, here's another piece of evidence for you to digest. And so that is, um, these are different plots of models. So the black trace here uh, corresponds to the observed changes in temperature. Um, and what we do with models is we try to see if we have the chemistry and the physics right to see if we can match the observations, right? And so um, what we do is, okay, we'll find, run all the models that we know, and not all the models are perfect, so that's why it gives you this uh, variability uh, in terms of the spread of the data. 
but they all seem to indicate, you know, you have the, the big trend, again, this is climate, um, where there's going to be each of these little wiggles, uh, even within a shorter time span than that. Um, but but the, key here, here, the, the key point here is that when we run our models, we have sort of a natural variability component and a human activity component. And we can choose, because it's a mathematical model, we can say, well, let's put, let's make this term to be zero and see what the rest looks like. And then let's make this other term to be zero and see what it looks like. And this is what you get here. So the summary is that if you only include natural factors, so humans have nothing to do with it, here's, here are the observations that you're trying to, to uh, model. You don't get them. You, you can't get there because the warming that you're adding here is not provided by the system itself. Um, similarly, if you say it's all human based, you get this answer, and that is if you don't include natural variability, which sort of changes a little bit of the, uh, the, the, the direction of, of the warming, you overshoot that observation. So uh, natural variability in some ways is, is actually helping to make it a little cooler than it would otherwise. Um, and so the way forward that we look at here is, okay, so what do we do now? These are observations of what we have so far. And where do we head from now, 100 years from now? Well, you can see that there's different ways that we can get to 2100. 20 100. But each way is going to depend on what we as as the Earth community choose to do. And so if we don't make any changes at all to how we're using energy and how we're extracting energy, um, this is going to be the red um, bars here. Basically, you know, if we go like business as usual, this is what we can expect based on our model uh, understanding of the system. This is what we would expect the Earth to look like in 100 years from now. If we curve some of the emissions, it's going to be less. And if we go even more, uh, see alternative energy and all that, it's, you know, we can get to a point of even reverting, uh, reversing the, the increase that we're currently trending towards. So um, where we're going to be, between, you know, in 10 years, 100 years from now, it all depends on what we do today, essentially. Um, I'm going to skip a few of this um, and show you. Some of this, when you hear people talk about climate change and the scenarios, a lot of people are talking about 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees, 3 or 4. And what I thought that this picture here gives an, actually a really good representation of um, is when people say, well, we want to hold global warming so that average of the whole Earth to 1.5 degrees. Well, this is what things would look like if we hold it at 1.5 degrees. So you're still having... Uh, warming of the land masses and some of the Arctic regions. Um, you're having uh, increases in decreases, uh, so floods and droughts, uh, depending on what part of the world you are, um, as well as, yeah, so floods and, and droughts in the sea. Uh, if you allow for more heating, if you don't do anything, then you can see how things are just getting more extreme, essentially. Um, and so it all depends on what choices we are up. Uh, currently, where we stand now, as of now, our uh, thermometers are saying that on average for the globe, we're roughly at the 1.25 mark, which is probably a little um, too far ahead from where we would like to be. We're wanting to hold it to 1.5, and we're nearing that number. Um, so action is really the topic of conversation these days in the community. It's no longer, is it happening? How long is it going to be until we get there? It's already. So uh, action is the best thing that we can do. Okay, now I want to share with you. Now you know everything about climate change. Now you know everything. <laughs> about climate change. Um, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Earth, uh, Earth's atmosphere. Um, perhaps not too much, except uh, you know uh, we're talking about this earlier actually. So uh, temperature as you go up in the mountains, it gets cooler. Um, as you go high in altitude, and then this is where your ozone uh, molecules live. So these are this is where that sunscreen we have is, and ozone is formed by absorbing UV radiation. That's why it heats up this layer of the atmosphere, so it gets warmer. Um, 
and then it gets even colder higher up, and then we go into space. Um, the area that I'm interested in studying, or that I've been doing for, for a few decades, is this part of the transition of the air that we emit at the surface, and how it goes into the stratosphere, and then how it gets distributed uh, throughout the world. Um, so this is a piece of fiction here. So this is sort of, these are the altitudes where the work that I do are focused on. So roughly um, in, in thousands of feet, we're talking about 40 to almost 70,000 feet, which is about twice as high as commercial uh, aircraft fly. That's why we need specialized airplanes to get us there. Now, okay, here's a really fun fact. <laughs> This is where we are. Okay, so um, if I take you back for a second, I told you here about um, where the atmosphere, how the atmosphere is divided up into layers. So if I look at you know the depth of the atmosphere, just to give you a perspective for how deep the atmosphere is. Um, so about 30 uh, miles, if you just take 30 miles vertical, it puts you roughly at 99 percent of the air, so most of the atmosphere is below you. If we go to about 55 miles up in the air, you have practically all the atmosphere below you. But we don't like just practically, we like just go all the way, so roughly if you go to 75 miles, you're in space, essentially. So what does that mean? Like those distances look like, oh sure, the stratosphere is pretty high up, or space, that's pretty high up. Well, let's put that in perspective. I said, folks, it's fun exercise. Um, from Randolph, New Hampshire. <laughs> so where does 30 miles put us? So if you were to take a horizontal distance from Randolph and just move it vertically, right? Or vertically, just move it horizontally. So roughly 30 miles would put us in Conway. So between here and Conway, if you take that distance, that's, you got most of the atmosphere contained within that. Uh, distance. So now let's go a little bit further out. So I had to look it up. So roughly Wyndham, Maine, it's about 55, 55 miles. And I'm like thinking like bees line, right? So if you go from Randolph, take the distance here, you're pretty much 99.9999% of the atmosphere is below you. And just because we want to know where space is, that's in Bitterford, Maine. So if you were to go from here to Bitterford, if you, if you go past Bitterford, you're in space. That's it. You're, you're gone. We lost you. Um, so, and I'm sure it'd be fun. Um, so, but all this to say, this is just a zooming version of it, but I'm going to put it in the context of the U.S. This is the distance that you need to travel to go to space. It's not much. And so when you think about it, how much is happening within that distance between the surface and the and space uh, that we are affecting, not only from the perspective of what we're emitting, but how things are moving around the globe. Uh, the atmosphere is so thin. Um, a friend of mine uh, once told me, he's like, one analogy is essentially the atmosphere is to the earth as the skin of an apple is to the apple itself. Yet the atmosphere is so powerful because it connects worlds away, right? I mean, we can smell uh, wildfires from Canada, like, you know, British Columbia all the way here. Um, and so you know that things are not disconnected. Um, and so a lot of energy gets moved around uh, through the air that we breathe and um, where, you know, life happens, really. And so, some of the fun stuff that I get to do is basically look at well, composition and circulation in the stratosphere. And to do that, I play with cool toys. So these are the planes that I have had the privilege to work with. Um, this is the high altitude, uh, the NASA ER-2, which is a uh, U-2 spy plane. Um, they fly, um, well, officially, they can tell us up until 70,000 feet, anything below that, above that, they can tell us because it's classified. Um, so they, they, whenever we, we fly with, um, with the crew, um, they just tell us, we, we ask them to go as high as possible, and like 70, that's all we can do, we can't go any higher, even though we would love to go higher. You, you gotta ask, right? 
<laughs> All they just need to know. Okay, fine. Um, then I had the opportunity to work with the Global Hawk, which is an unmanned aircraft, uh, which can be up in the air for uh, 24 consecutive hours, uh, which is one thing that no other airplane can do. And it has allowed us to do some very exciting science in very remote locations of, of the world that we couldn't do otherwise. Um, and then I had the opportunity to work with the Gulfstream 5, where we actually took this trip, uh, essentially pole to pole, and sample uh, Earth's atmosphere. Uh, my first love was the B-57, uh, which is also another high altitude plane. It doesn't fly as high as the ER-2, but still does very cool science. Uh, and then we got the opportunity to work on a project with a Sherpa, which is more of a lower altitude aircraft. Um, so some of the fun stuff that we do is, um, here's an example of it. So this is the uh, Gulfstream 5. So we started in Colorado, which is where the aircraft is based. And so we did this tour around the world, uh, up and down the Pacific to uh, as far north as 87 degrees north. Uh, and then 10 days later, we were at the edge of Antarctica, um, which was really pretty cool. We did stop along the way because we had to refuel. Um, we couldn't just fly straight. The Earth is still a pretty big, big planet. Um, but what we did in the process of flying from point to point was we would porpoise, essentially. And so like, we would start you know, at any location, and then we would literally go up and down, up and down. And as we moved up and down with the aircraft, we had uh, 22 instruments on board, and they were all measuring different, com uh, different chemical molecules along the way. And so we were all responsible for different com uh, chemicals. So essentially, you know, it's kind of like doing your a blood test, right? You know, they, they measure different parts of your blood. That's what we're doing with the air. We're just measuring different chemical compounds. Uh, and I was part of uh, an instrument that measure um, greenhouse gases concentrations. Uh, and just quickly to show you, this is what our actual, what our data looked like. So you see different colors here. The colors correspond to concentration. So you can see at this altitude higher up, at this latitude, so this was roughly subtropical region, we're seeing enhancements in carbon monoxide, which is a chemical that tells you that there's pollution. Uh, so it's from uh, incomplete combustion that happens. Now, one can say, okay, well, you see high CO, okay, well, what's the big deal? Well, the, the big deal is that we're seeing it here, right in the middle of the ocean, where there are no sources of CO. So that tells you that it's just air that's moving across the globe, and it's coming from some places and going to others. Um, and so this is another uh, project that I work with, which was with the Global Hawk, and in this case, we were sampling this part of the atmosphere. Uh, so these are the tropical uh, regions that are very difficult to access um, because there's nowhere to land, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is, again, this part of, of the layer of the atmosphere that we're interested in where a lot of exchange happens and it has uh, implications for the climate uh, change and uh, long-term changes in uh, composition of the air. Um, and for that, you know, you get to play with cool planes again and, and, and get to work with amazing people along the way. Uh, and it's, it's hard work. When, uh, when this plane flew, uh, this is a colleague of mine, Bruce Dobby. Um, he and I were in charge of our instruments, which is installed down here. And uh, one flight for this aircraft was about 24 hours long. And for us, that translated into about 36 hours of work. And we will just take turns uh, working. Um, but what does our data look like? You know, this is like, you know, uh, first row for like, what does an atmospheric scientist do? We build the instruments, we fly them, but then what do things look like? Well, this is an example. This is a um, paper that I'm, uh, that I'm working on as well, where we're seeing, um, this is two tracers that our instrument measures, so carbon um, monoxide and methane, and this is just what we collected as the plane flew up in altitude. Note uh, the altitudes here are between 46,000 and 62,000, so much higher than commercial flights. Uh, but what's weird about it is that at 54,000, you see how this goes up? So increases in carbon monoxide and methane at the same time. You shouldn't see that there, and certainly not over the ocean again. And those are very high altitudes to find that. Um, so these are the points where we sample those those air masses, and then we can use tra um, trajectory calculations, essentially, that basically, you know, you just put the winds, the wind information, and then just 
see, okay, where, where did that wind come from? And you just take it back in time, which is what this color corresponds to here. And what you find out is that all these elevated um, tracers of essentially biomass burning uh, came uh, from Africa and some also from Indonesia. So we're over you know, half a world away and we're seeing the effect of African biomass burning up in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. The concern for us is that this is a region that's very critical for what enters into the global stratosphere. So whatever comes into here, it's gonna make it to, um, it's gonna stay in the air for, for several decades. Um, and so you tra trace it back to satellite observations and this is where all those uh, fires were burning. And we're seeing them totally um, separated from the location of where they were actually happening. We're sampling them over here. Um, this is another example of data. And I promise you this is the last one, but I thought it might be cool to show you. Uh, this is a campaign that I was part of in 2002 where we were in Key West, Florida, down here, and we were doing our, our measurements, and suddenly, again, we are high in the atmosphere. This is in the stratosphere. We're seeing enhancements in, again, carbon monoxide. And this is an instrument that measures a number of particles in the air. And so we see this correlation of elevated CO and particles. And when you trace it back to the origin of where that air came from, some of it takes you back to um, Canada where at the time there were uh, forest fires happening um, and as well as Montana. And so all this is happening here and the circulation of the air is such that it just turned around and here we are in it was Florida, not just sampling in it, but even like you can see some of the haze and even smell it from the surface. Um, so the fun part, you, you make the measurements, um, but so I'm, one of my passions is actually building things and, and being experimental about it. And so the question is, well, how did you get to those numbers, right? And so these are the conditions that we see in the atmosphere. So this is how temperature decreases as a function of altitude. So this is about um, 55 to 60,000 feet up here, pretty high up. And so we have an instrument that we want to make sure it works here but the instrument, if you buy it from the factory, they tell you, well, these are the specs. So our instrument, if it's below 10 degrees Celsius, it won't work, sorry. <laughs> and then um, if the pressure is below, in this case, 300 millibar, it won't work either. So good luck, have fun. So this is where the brilliance of engineers, like uh, my colleague, comes into play, where now you just build the instrument so it can measure under this condition. And so there's a, a lot of engineering involved. And so this is an example of what we did. So this is what you find available. You just call the car and say, I want to order this instrument. You give them X number of dollars, <laughs> they give you the box, and then you take it apart. <laughs> That's what we do at Harvard. Uh, we just have to retrofit it um, so that it can work under the conditions that we need them to work. And so there's a lot of play that happens in the lab. Um, and then you have to do a lot of tests to make sure that the instrument works properly. So NASA is very particular about if you install something brand new, you gotta make sure that it's not gonna take the plane down. Luckily, this is a plane that's unmanned, so you know, not a huge loss. Still, uh, it would be huge if the plane falls out of the sky over land and populated areas. So we fly them over water just to be safe. Um, but we still have to submit our instrument to all these different tests before it flies, then we install it. And then this is what work looked like when we were doing those 36 hour stints. Uh, where I remember the first time I came, uh, this is an undisclosed location in uh, Southern California. It's not that in Southern California. Um, so I remember the first time I visited, so this is called the Global Hawk Operations Center, the G Hawk, the pilots and all the crew of the aircraft sit here. They fly the plane with a keyboard and, and a mouse. Um, and we as scientists sit back here and monitor our instruments and communicate anytime we have to. Um, I remember the first time I came here, I stood back here and I just counted the number of monitors in front of my eyes. And talk about visual overload. There are about 47 monitors that I'm like, where do I look? <laughs> it's like too much information. 
but somehow you, you figure where to look and, and, and keep your sanity. Um, but the work that we do is essentially that. So we, or the work that I do. So we, we start with chips. Uh, we all are familiar with chips in our computers and cell phones and everything. So we go from a chip to chip with wires and more chips. So you create this instrument. Um, then you install that instrument on a plane. Then you fly that plane throughout the world. And then you collect data. Again, this is data from our instrument. So this is latitude versus altitude. And so you can see, well, you have enhanced or, you know, the redder colors and it's more of that chemical. So you have more of that chemical, uh, you know, at this latitude and altitude. You have less on this other side. Do we understand why? Yes, we do. And that's part of studying climate change is because in some other day, this red is not going to be 399, which is not anymore. It's going to be 420, and that matters. Uh, that's what we're seeing with this uh, long-term changes. Um, and so you fly on the plane, then you provide the data, and then it's based on the data that we produce that uh, policy uh, gets made. Uh, that's not my forte. I don't know. Uh, this is where I stop, right, right here. I stop. <laughs> but I'm, I'm equally interested in the rest because we're all part of this planet together. Um, I just briefly want to show you this is the ER2 that we were flying, uh, one of my favorite planes. Um, and that plane, I told you, 70,000. They told us no more. So, um, they fly, roughly we were flying this campaign uh, based out of Salina, Kansas, and we were studying what the impact of all these storms that are happening nowadays that are so violent. They're injecting, our hypothesis is that they're injecting a lot of the air at the surface, which is very polluted, straight into the stratosphere. Mm -hmm. And so it's a short circuit to what it would normally happen <laughs> otherwise. Uh, so we're wanting to see what all chemicals are coming in a matter of hours instead of months and years, which would be otherwise, uh, in just a matter of hours what's coming through the storms. So we were uh, doing all this sampling at those high altitudes. And so um, this is our instrument too. There's a lot of lab work that's involved in understanding how it works and how it performs. Then we install, and then uh, for this campaign, our instrument was flying on the belly of the plane. There were instruments all over, all over this aircraft. Uh, but the fun thing is, like a plane like the, uh, the ER-2, uh, because it flies so high, the, it's a single seat, the pilots have to wear what's called <coughs> a pressure suit. It's the same uh, suit that astronauts wear. Um, so there's a lot of preparation that's involved before they take off. Um, their office space is crammed, <laughs> but they have pretty darn good views, uh, like you can see here, some of the storms that they took uh, pictures of over here. And um, so why it matters what we do with the aircraft is because it's just a bridge to other uh, types of measurements like satellite measurements. So right now, our group is working on building an instrument that's going to be launched into space hopefully next year to measure methane concentrations, uh, focusing on methane concentrations. And that's part of, a, of an approach to, if we do want to limit the impacts of human activity and changes in the climate, we can't just tackle CO2, which is something that a lot of people hear, oh, CO2 is bad. It is, but there are other ones that are also bad that we can tackle and, and get more out of uh, mitigating those on a shorter time, time scale than CO2 and methane. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip a little bit of this, just I want to show you a few other things. Um, the question then becomes, okay, we have evidence of change, this is how we measure it, so what do we do with that information? And what we do with that information is what I summarize in here as a way forward. I think it all starts with awareness and connection. We just have to be aware that it's happening, not just, just put, you know, be blindfolded and ignore what, what is actually happening. Um, and this information is a big issue, uh, not just with climate change, with a lot of topics, it is, I think it's human nature in some ways, um, but it's our responsibility for those of us who are doing some of this work to help and, and just share what we do know, and that's why I'm here, and I'm delighted and honored and appreciative that you're here listening. 
um, because it's, it's part of, of how we move forward. Um, and in terms of, of specifics, you know, well, what can we really do? It, it really is about thinking, okay, on a step-by-step -step basis, where is the energy that I'm using today coming from and what I can do uh, on a small scale. Um, there have been a lot of changes in how we're using energy uh, as a result of the last uh, two, three decades of us understanding climate change. There's shift into renewable energies and, and all that, and, and it's all been very positive. Uh, unfortunately, it's not enough, so we just have to pick up the pace as, as a global community to, uh, to contain things. Um, and this is just an example where, you know, renewable energy is now sitting at about 12% of our total energy um, sources, which is great. It, it, it was close to nothing before, so we're making progress in that direction. I mean, it's, it's in infrastructure and also changing mentality and, and lifestyles that are going to have to govern some of the um, changes that we're going to have to see happen. And I think this will be posted, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but there are a lot of organizations online that we can follow and not just keep it local, but also on a more national and even global scale of action, but um, emphasis on the action. And then this is the last bit that I want to share with you, and this is um, the sort of like that inspiration question that uh, I was talking to Mary and to Sarah about that. Um, why do we care about any of this? You know, what's, what's the real, what's the ultimate message here? Um, and the uh, priest from our church uh, shared this excerpt from, uh, with me uh, from St. Basil's book, and I was just fascinated by it. As a scientist, I don't often, I confess, I don't often think about it in this terms until he said this, and I thought, well, of course. Um, and I just want to share it with you and read it um, out loud. So we can all hear the words that say, created world is really the school where reasonable souls exercise themselves, the training ground where they learn to know God, since by the sight of visible and sensible things, the mind is led, as by a hand, to the contemplation of invisible things. We're just humans who just want tangible things and we want to see and we just want to know that it exists uh, and sometimes we can't see it or touch it but we know it exists and to me this is a beautiful summary of, of how God talks to us, of how he shares life with us um, but it's really up to us to see it even though we can't see it, um, we can still see it through our hearts uh, and I think it's an important message to of, of humility and of inspiration that, you know, we can touch a tree, we can smell the roses, uh, we can enjoy the rain, um, but it's all really connected. We're part of something that's bigger than just us wanting to charge our cell phones today. <laughs> so there's a bigger skill. And then talking to Mary, we were discussing, uh, the guys we were talking about, John Philip Noodles, uh, some of his prayer. There was this one that inspired me, and I wanted to share this one as well with you. It's the, the opening prayer from Sunday, from the Celtic uh, benediction book, um, that reads, I watch this morning for the light that the darkness has not ever come. I watch for the fire that was in the beginning, and that burns still in the brilliance of the rising sun. I watch for the glow of light that gleams in the growing earth, and glistens in sea and sky. I watch for your light, O oh God, in the eyes of every living creature and in the ever living flame of my own soul. If the grace of seeing were mine this day, I would glimpse you in all that lives. Grant me the grace of seeing this day. Grant me the grace of seeing. And I would personally add the words every day. Uh, grant me the grace of seeing every day. It really is a spectacular in front of our eyes of what we experience uh, on this earth and we shouldn't take it for granted. Um, and then a dear friend of mine um, whose grandfather passed away many years ago 
um, share some of this poetry with me. Um, he was a cowboy in Southern California who, by my French recollection, he was not a man of God. He never stepped in the church. Um, my friend never heard him talk about God or religion, for that matter. But he had a very deep sense of connection, a natural connection, an undeniable connection that we all humans have with not just Mother Earth, but uh, with life on Earth. And he um, put together several poems um, that were just inspired by his own experiences. And this one caught my attention because it's along the same theme of um, John and uh, St. Basil's words. Um, and this one is called My Friend the Owl. And I've shared it with you. Um, and the breeze, as the years went by, a wise old owl will sit in our tent. And as I work around, he will call to me, saying, Look up, man, look up. There's so many beautiful things to see. Variety is the spice of life. That's what keeps us sane. No two moments are alike. No two sunsets are the same. Oh, if I had listened more to what the old bird had to say, I would be a wiser and better man today. And I think it's goes back to the, the idea of just we just need to open our eyes and see what's out there. And while maybe a responsibility, at least um, by our connection to, to with nature and God within nature, and it's our responsibility to take care of it and, and protect it. So why do we care about climate? And in my mind, it's because through it, I find uh, we find ourselves, we find each other, and through it, uh, we also find and reunite with God. Um, so, from Randall, from this beautiful little town in New Hampshire, um, found this beautiful picture of Mount Jefferson. This is the connection. We're all together in this planet. Some of you were alive when this happened. I wasn't. Um, but, uh, nonetheless, I it's like one of my most uh, inspiring pictures to see. It's just a reminder of how little we are, yet how powerful we And last but not least, please just thank my family for their support. Um, my uh, dog, Jeremy Shepherd Lena, and my husband, Jason, who uh, just put up with all my crazy hours. And uh, whether I'm traveling or not, they're always there to welcome me your life with me, so um, we certainly can't do it by ourselves. And